I guess it's time to say good morning and welcome. I'm glad that so many of you are interested in uh, data mining. I would like to do a very brief introduction of myself and also of the presentation, and then we'll get cracking. So first of all, my name is Rafael Lukaviecki. I don't work for Microsoft. I work for a small consulting company based, well, actually, until last month, it was based both in the United Kingdom and in Ireland, but we have now moved to Ireland, so we are completely Irish-based. We've been in business for nine years, and I have specialized in several different areas, notably over the past um, uh, previous few years, my main area of speciality has been security. Data protection with cryptography was what I've been doing for years. And you know, when you do data protection, you hide somebody's data very well. Now, I've been doing data protection for almost 13 years. So after 13 years of hiding data, you want to do the other side. You want to actually find what was hidden. And that's exactly what data mining does. Data mining uses almost the same ideas as data protection and cryptography, but to find what is hidden. And that's what this session is about. I hope some of you have noticed that I have four presentations today. This one serves in a way as an introduction to the day because I will be talking all day about an unusual, perhaps to some of you, use of technology that's very future oriented uh, that I think will also change the way some of you do your job. And we start with this session. So let's find hidden intelligence using data mining. In this session, I will first of all, very, very quickly introduce what is data mining, what would you use it for, and we'll say a few words about the prerequisites in terms of what you need on the server, what do you need on the client, and how do you approach the whole process. After that, I want to actually show you data mining in action. So in this um, one hour presentation, I will switch five times to my demo computer, on which I will give you actually four times, on which I will give you four different live demos of data mining from different perspectives. And hopefully I'll tantalize you with this technology so that um, uh, you start using it. So with that in mind, on the agenda first, the introductions to the process and the, um, and the server and the technology and the whole idea behind it, and then those four product demonstrations. We'll first classify customers, then we are going to look at the riskiness and profitability, after which we'll predict what will they do next, as if we had a magical ball, and finally, we will do maybe boring but important forecasting of numerical data. Let's start with uh, an introduction to this technology and uh, what does data mining do? The most important central part of what data mining does is finding patterns. It finds a pattern of behavior, of intelligence, of logic hiding somewhere in possibly mountain of your data. You give it thousands, perhaps millions, billions, trillions of rows of data, and if there is a meaning there, data mining will be able to unearth it. Once you find a pattern, you can visualize it, you can explore it, and so you can understand your data better. You can understand something maybe that you never knew about your customers or the behavior of your application. And the third part, if the pattern works and it's tested, validated, and useful, you can predict. This is, to some people, the most exciting part, because predicting the future is obviously fun by the very name of it, but it's also predicting the past, predicting things that happened that you didn't know, like fraud detection, or predicting what's happening right now in the present. So predicting is not just for the future. It's not just forecasting of the future. Data mining is a set of technologies that discover very hidden patterns. It's young. Most of data mining is less than 20 years old, with maybe one exception. One algorithm is uh, somewhat older. The naive Bayesian classifier that you know for spam analysis, no doubt, is actually almost 300 years old, invented by the Reverend Bayes um, at the time for the needs of the church. It uses a combination of statistics, probability, those are the old things, but very good things, and some new things artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Notably, neural network technology is used very extensively in data mining, and all of this is inside SQL Server 2008 analysis services, and I guarantee to you that if you go to people who know SQL well, they have no idea that they have this technology in it. This is so little known that obviously I would like all of you to be able to benefit from it today. 
So with that in mind, uh, let's talk briefly about some server and process considerations for data mining. Data mining, as I already said, is part of SQL Server. Specifically, it's part of SQL Server analysis services. It comes in the standard edition, enterprise edition, and the developer editions, not in any other edition. Of course, there are differences. Of course, as you can guess, the enterprise edition is more customizable. It has a few other things. But if you are new to this area and you have never done data mining, the standard edition will give you all the tools you need to try it out. And data mining is, in a way, the little brother of multidimensional data analysis, also known as OLAP, Online Analytical Processing, which everybody has heard of as that's the thing that deals with cubes, dimensions, and so on. Those two are independent of each other. You do not need a cube to do data mining. You do not need data mining to create a cube. But you can use them together, although this is unusual. This is not the most straightforward, perhaps, thing to do. So what could you do with data mining? Well, here are some typical uses of uh, this whole area of predictive analysis based on the technology we are talking about. Finding what makes a customer profitable. Is it the color of the hair or is it their income? Answers for all of you could be different. Of course, if you are selling shampoos, color of the hair might be very important. Understanding their needs. Why do they buy one product with something else but never another product in the same transaction? being able to anticipate churn. Why do some customers say goodbye and move to your competitor as fast as you can say hello? And why do you gain some customers from your other competitor without actually doing almost any work? Being able to predict sales and inventory, numerical predictions in other words. This is very old type of forecasting, but still very important. How much money will you make next month? Or, for example, when will you need to upgrade your servers or your disk space because we are predicting that you will run out of it? Ability to build an effective marketing campaign is at the very heart of data mining. A lot of data mining was invented for marketing, but it's no longer the biggest use of this technology. I always like to say, if you know somebody who sends spam messages knowingly, I'm not talking about the bot computers and zombies, of course, that um, uh, most people unknowingly tend to somehow do, but people who knowingly send spam, we don't always like those people, you know. So tell them to learn data mining, because if they know data mining, there will be less spam. Why? because data mining will be able to predict exactly who should get the email without upsetting everybody else. Data mining effectively is a technology that can magically tell you who is the person that needs to buy a product to enhance their physiognomy right now without having to send the message to everybody else. Of course, the price, thank you for that, is that we would have to share with them a little bit too much data uh, probably more than we are comfortable to share, but nevertheless, data mining is the technology to help our not friend spammers. Okay, preventing fraud, big stuff, very difficult, very complex, but data mining can be very useful here. It can spot patterns of transactions that lead to fraud. It is famously used for money laundering detections, and it's famously used by larger credit card companies. How many times have you been in this position that you've been using your credit card for something that's in pattern, suddenly you do an unusual transaction and someone calls you to check whether it's your transaction? Have you been there? You just bought, yeah, thank you very much. You bought a, I don't know, a boat, then you bought a yacht, then you buy a helicopter and everything's okay. And then you want to buy a cup of coffee and suddenly, no. That can't be you. You should be spending at least one million kroner. Anything below it, your card must be stolen. Okay, this is of course something that is rather primitive form of data mining, but you can use it to detect all sorts of much more insidious types of uh, fraud if you are careful. And finally, one of um, more nerdy but important uses of data mining is to use it to improve data. During ETL, extract, transform, and load process, which is the bread and butter process of any data warehouse BI system, unfortunately needs to deal with data that is just wrong. 
And how do you deal with data that's wrong? Well, first of all, you need to know what's wrong. Secondly, you want to fix it. This is a very expensive process if you do it manually. Companies spend 60 to 80% of their ITBI budgets on data cleansing alone. Data mining is one of those magical pieces of technology that actually does help improve it. Okay, so you've seen the uses. Let's talk a little bit about the architecture. What do you do, where and when? Well, first of all, you need SQL Server Analysis Services installation somewhere. SQL Server Analysis Services server is there. Wherever, we don't care. On it, it comes by default with nine predefined, Microsoft predefined data mining algorithms. Amazingly, you will see about five of them in the rest of this presentation. Those algorithms can be extended. You can add your own. As a developer, there is an API and an SDK, how to write your own algorithm, and it's very easy to do so. Where do you find everything I refer to when I say that it's there? No, don't worry, you don't have to search on Microsoft.com forever. There is a nice website called SQLServerDataMining.com. I will give you the URL at the end of the session in case you haven't memorized it, and that's where you can download the SDK and the API, etc. But anyway, there are nine Microsoft predefined algorithms. What do you do then? Step one, using either Business Intelligence Development Studio or Excel or Visio or SQL Server Management Studio, you deploy an empty mining model. Empty but defined. You've defined the data types and the content types. You say what will it do, but it knows nothing. Now you feed a lot of data to the server, historical data that represents past transactions, for example, and the algorithm of your choice looks for patterns. And if it finds those patterns, you can visualize the results, again, in Excel, Visio, if you want a quickie answer, using reporting services. And the most important for many of you as developers is, of course, in your application. Your application can query the model as if it was a database. You use a slightly different language for doing that. It's called DMX, Data Mining Extensions, which is a very, very gentle extension to Transact SQL, to T-SQL. And you will see some of it um, uh, as I go through today. Optionally, and this is very exciting part, your application can ask questions to the mining model to get answers, such as predict if this transaction fails. Predict if this customer is committing fraud, and so on and so on. This is, by the way, known as predictive programming, and it is a new way of uh, improving your software. I have a session about that. This is my third session today, I think the one after lunch, and it's called Architectural Uses of Business Intelligence for Application Design. If you want to see how you can stop writing 50% of your data validation routines, I'll show you the magic in that session. I will show you a live application that actually performs input validation with no ifs, with no rules. Well, actually, there's one if. That's one if which just uses the data mining model to find the answers. It sounds like magic, and you may not even believe me, but when you see it, you will. And that's the future. You will see that, but not in this session. That's going to be in the architectural uses of business intelligence this afternoon. Right now, what I would like to do is to summarize this mining process and actually show you data mining in action. So, mining process in summary. We started with an empty mining model, no pattern in it, but well-defined. Now we passed so-called training data, representing history of the past through the data mining engine, and it found the pattern, or not, by the way. You don't always find the pattern, so you need to test and validate what you are doing. But typically, you will find a pattern, at least at your early days, you will find some pattern to improve it and go on and get better ones later as long as there is one. And optionally, you can now take that pattern and new data on which you want to perform predictions to predict the future, the present, or the unknown past. What did that person do? Where did they come from? If you would like to be able to find that, provided it's legal and you have the data, data mining certainly can help you. I do want to stress that legal and also perhaps ethical sometimes, as uh, unfortunately I have met users of data mining which um, do not always agree with my perception of those two things. As you realize, technology runs ahead of democracy sometimes, and um, well, I think you understand where I'm getting to. 
OK, enough talking, enough waving hands, time to see it in action. So four demos, four scenarios. The very first one, I want to show you how to build your first mining model from zero. You've uh, nothing. I'll start just with a simple table showing me customers. And I will classify and segment them to find out who are my customers, who is more or less profitable than somebody else. And to do that, I want to introduce Microsoft decision trees. Decision trees are a big group of data mining techniques which are easy to understand, generally fast, and which are very informative. They understand the pattern as a set of logical probabilistic decisions. That may sound complex if you've never seen it before, so trust me, in the demo you will understand it. Everybody in the room will understand it very well. Microsoft decision trees are like a combine harvester of decision trees. They have several different techniques inside, grouped into those for classifying data, regressing numerical data, and performing associative analysis. If you are interested in associative analysis, I have another session about it today, and this is my second session. Not the one I just advertised, but the other one. The one that will be in this room, not in the next slot, but the slot after that, called Automatic Recommendation Engine Using Data Mining. You will see the associative analysis over there. So if you've ever been to a website which says customers who bought that were also interested in this, and you want to know how do they do that, that is called associative analysis, and I'll talk more about it there. But right now, I want to build your first decision tree just to understand what makes some customers buy many, many cars from my company. For this demo, I will be a car dealership. So for this demo, let me switch over to my machine. This is actually a machine I use when I visit my customers to do data mining. So this is running Vista, and inside it, I've got SQL Server 2008. Uh, enterprise edition locally installed as those two things together give me all the data mining tools you need. So I'm going to do it pretty much live for you so you see all the steps. So the very first thing I want to do is I want to launch uh, SQL Server Business Intelligence Development Studio. Of course, it's hosted in Visual Studio, but remember, if you are new to all of this, these tools are provided with SQL 2, so you don't need to actually go the Visual Studio way if you are new to this area. File, new project, and the project I will be creating is an analysis services project, like many projects of business intelligence types, but not for the same purpose, and we are going to call it Profiling at uh, NDC. Okay, an empty structure of a project has been created, and I will very quickly add a data source and a data source view, nothing exciting there to see, after which I will build a mining structure, which is the thing using which I will find the answer to the question, who buys many cars from me? So using the wizard, I will use a connection I already have here to a local database on SQL 2008 called Happy Cars. That database I will connect to insecurely. Please do not do this on a real installation. The only reason I use a service account is because it's faster and easier for the demo as I don't need to log in and log out. But if I keep explaining why it is bad and the other thing is good, I will negate the benefit of using it. So I'll just go next and tell you don't do what I just did do every other option but that one. And besides, it shouldn't work even if you did it and you configured security correctly. So now a new data source, hello wizard as before, using of course that data um, uh, source uh, that we have uh, created a minute ago. I extract all the stuff in there and the only table I want to be looking at is called customers inside my SQL Server database I connected to. Again, nothing to see here other than that I want to show you what's in this table. So we are looking at one simple flat table that contains, as you see, some demographics about my customers, such as their name, marital status, and so on. And at the very bottom, two very interesting attributes, two very interesting columns number of purchases they made, and the profit they generated for me in my business. Um, any of you who are database designers here are probably getting a little horrified that somebody would store that in one table, because of course you wouldn't. You would keep it somewhere else in a transactional system in many places. In an analytical system, it would probably be in a cube. But why do I do it like that? 
because data mining wants it. Lesson one, if you want to data mine anything, you must flatten your data into one table preferably, maybe into two, but when you do it into two, that's for special purposes only. If you are data mining, you will have to flatten, flatten, flatten everything. So if you don't want to create another table, which is of course not efficient often, create a view. No problem with that, but it has to be in one flat table. Otherwise, it becomes a bit meaningless. Okie dokie, let me show you some data here so you understand what is actually hiding over there. And here is an example of customers such as Elizabeth Johnson, born on that date with a pretty high income. And if I scroll this to the end, you can see that Elizabeth Johnson bought five cars from me and she generated over 10,000 euros of profit. So this is the data. And my question is, is there a correlation between these things, the numbers of cars people buy and everything else I know about them? And that's what data mining will do. It will discover if there is a pattern showing that certain people of some characteristics buy more or not so many cars. So how do I do that? Well, that's the interesting part. I will create a new mining structure over here first. Hello, wizard again. It asks me, am I mining a table or a cube? You will be mining tables most of the time. 80 to 90% you mine tables. Very rarely you tend to mine cubes. Next, which technique would I want to use? And all of the techniques you see here are the nine algorithms that come with SQL Server 2008. Indeed, I will show you more than decision trees later, but right now I want to show you decision trees. So if you're wondering where is this neural network hiding, there you are. If you added your own or you bought or wherever you added algorithms, they of course would also show in this list. So using the decision trees technique and that data source view, I will now perform the first important step in building my model. I will decide what I will predict and what will I study. So what I want to do is I want to predict the number of purchases people make. This is the predictable column. I want to build a model that tells me if there is a correlation between anything I know and people buying five or three or two cars. So number of purchases becomes my predictable column. That's why I, of course, selected that checkbox. And as input, I want to select everything that makes sense that I can legally analyze. So birth date, commute distance, education, gender, home ownership, marital status, number of children they have, occupation, profit generated, total number of children, and yearly income. As you have noticed, I selected pretty much everything except for first name, last name, and the middle name. Why am I avoiding the names? That's not because I couldn't study it. Absolutely. All of data mining is actually based on a form of text mining. It's like what Google does or Bing or whoever you use. The reason I avoided names is different because if you don't have too much data, you will find unusual correlations. And I only have 10,000 customers here. So if I analyze the names, I would find strange correlations. By the way, if you have a lot of names, you shouldn't find a correlation, but sometimes you do. And that's quite exciting. I have no knowledge if this would work in Norway, so you will have to check it. But in United States, in UK, in Ireland, in Canada, in Australia, but not in India, you've noticed I'm selecting English-speaking countries from some parts of the world, except the biggest one. In those countries which I mentioned, there is amazingly a correlation between the first letter of the first name of the person and the first letter of the name of the product they buy in a supermarket. So John prefers jam, Mary prefers marmalade. I have no idea why. Psychologists probably can answer it. I just know there is a correlation. It's slight, but it is there. Find out in Norway and send me an email. I'd love to know whether, you know, you're wonderful people. Actually, that would be interesting to study the Norwegians in Minnesota in the States, whether they have correlations. Oh, I'm sure they do. I guess Garrison Keeler would be better to answer that question. 
Anyway, we are moving on and we are going to define the content and the data types for those things we will study. By the way, don't worry about the data types. This is the one time you as developers can forget about worrying about data types because in mining we are looking for high level abstractions. So the more generic the better. Indeed, if you treat everything as text, it will work fine. But if you treat something as numerical data, you can build an additional type of a model known as a regressive model, which gives you a little bit more ability to see the future. The gentleman has a question. Do you have a loud voice? Yes. Uh, can, uh, the number of that are used, uh, the gentleman, if I heard correctly, I selected the number of purchases as input and as output. Is that correct? The gentleman noticed here that I selected this box, and not this one, this one. Let me select it again. And is that correct or not? That's a very good question, which I actually didn't want to answer, which is why I skipped it very quickly. But since you asked, I will give you the answer. By the way, I explain it in full detail in my five and a half hour free of charge seminar available on Microsoft.com forward slash TechNet Spotlight. It's currently the blockbuster of the month. But to answer your question, in this case, it doesn't matter because I have only one thing I am predicting. Why? Because to predict something, you always have to look at it as an input. This is not mystic Meg predicting from a crystal ball. You need to know the past to predict the future. You need to know the future to predict the past. You need to know now to predict other now. So this is not coming from the earth. So always predictable is an input. So now you ask, is it a broken interface? Why can I then select it if it's always an input? Because I could have more than one predictable thing and I don't always want to use one predictable thing as input for predicting another. In other words, if you check this box, it means that this input is used for predicting itself and other predictable outputs. If you don't check it, it means it's used only for predicting itself, but it is not used as an input for predicting other columns. That's it. Five and a half hours, but this is not what I go about five and a half hours about. So actually right now, it would make absolutely no difference what I do here. But if I had another predictable thing like this, it would make sense because now this wouldn't be used to predict that, but it would be used to predict this. Does that clarify? Thank you very much. Well done for spotting. And moving on, let's make sure I haven't changed anything here that I shouldn't. No, that's good. Okay, moving on, as I told you, do not get hung up about data types. However, do worry a little about content types, but don't worry too much. In general, don't worry too much. So number of purchases, which is what I'm trying to predict, is currently continuous, but I will change it to discrete. The reason I will do it is because a discrete model is more interesting. A discrete model is a probabilistic model where you understand the answers more readily. A continuous model is potentially more accurate, but it gives you equations. And this is uh, 9.27 in the morning after a whole day and you've been partying all night as all of those Norwegian people apparently do. So you don't want to look at equations in the morning. That's why we'll go with a nice colorful discrete model. But if you are not sure what to do, do both and see which one is better. One of the nice things in SQL is that you can actually build several models in parallel. It's an advantage of the tool and it allows you to compare them against each other. But in my case, number of purchases will be discrete since that is uh, more interesting for us this morning. Next, I need to decide how much data not to use for building the model, but to keep on the side for testing. And 30% is a frequently used number, meaning that if I have 10,000 customers, 3,000 customers are not used to build the model. Why not? This is how we test models. We randomly select those 3,000, put them aside, and we call that a holdout. Now I build the model from 7,000 customers. But how do I know if it works? What I do is I predict the number of purchases for those 3,000 I kept aside, and SQL is not cheating. SQL knows, of course, how many cars they bought, but it's not looking at that. It's using the model to predict what you built the model for, 
And after that, it compares. Like when you do, um, when you do Sudoku, when you say, aha, did I get it right? Or a crossword. So SQL predicts those 3,000 and then says, oh, did I get it right? How many times did I get it right? And if SQL predicted using your model exactly what were the cases, you have a model known as accurate. And this is a very important test which you must do. This is not the only test. You also have to test reliability of the model and usefulness, which I'm not going to explain right now, but my seminar, you guessed five and a half hours, you can fast forward to this section, explains how to do it in detail. Nevertheless, this is an important technique, by the way, only in SQL Server 2008. Much of data mining was in SQL 2005, by all means, but a lot of nice things like that were added in SQL 08 by Microsoft. Finally, I give it a name, I click finish, and what? I have a model. This is a definition of the model. It will use decision trees to predict the number of purchases, treating everything else as input. Um, and by the way, to the gentleman who was asking the question earlier, you could change here to uncheck the checkbox by selecting predict only. Predict only means the same thing as I didn't select it as an input. That was just to the gentleman who was interested. And in case you don't need predict is, of course, always the easier, better choice since it doesn't preclude using a certain column for predicting others. But sometimes you don't want to. Anyway, I have a model, but it's empty. You want to see the pattern. How do I get the pattern? What do I need to do to be able to view this model? You need to deploy it to the server and you need to train the model. So in order to do that, you click your always friendly green button the model is being deployed right now to my SQL Server 2008 analysis services on this computer. Once it has been deployed, the server will look for the patterns by looking through all of the 7,000 cases. And once the pattern has been found, you will see it in the viewer. And we are waiting for that right now. And there you are, the results are coming back and we have the results. This was very fast, but this certainly is not a real-time operation. Building a model is possibly a slow operation. Nevertheless, predicting using that model is fast, as I will show you later. So building the model, possibly slow. Using the model, very fast and possibly real-time. Anyway, this is the answer. The answer is most of my customers are blue followed by the pink ones, the green ones, the purple ones, and the yellow ones. But what does it mean? Zoom, this is the legend. The pink customers buy one car, blue customers are those who are most likely to buy two cars, green ones buy three cars, purple buy four cars, and the yellow customers buy five cars. As you see, in my 7,000 cases, I don't have many people who bought six, seven or more cars. So the bar is conversely very, very small. So, recession, we have to maximize our profits. My boss says we are selling to people who have a probability of buying four cars. Find me the four car buyers. So I'm interested in the purple people. So going back here, the answer is obvious. The most purple people are found amongst those who are rich. Those who make more than 100,000 euros per year tend to be purple mostly, whilst others tend to be other colors. But you know what? We are a luxury car dealership. All of our customers are quite wealthy, so that didn't help me find the right ones. So my question to you now is, in your head, or say out loud if you want to, please, what do you think will be the next attribute, column in other words, that will distinguish those who buy many cars from those who don't? What could it be? Gender. Number of children, gender. What else? So the gentleman is assuming that ladies or perhaps men buy more cars. Good hypothesis. Any other? Birthday. The date of birth, so younger or older. Very good. So you have some good ideas, but let's see whether you were right. How do I know whether you were right? Well, over here, I just need to click this plus. When I click this plus, I will see what is the next discriminant in terms of customers' propensity to buy many cars. And you were wrong. As you see, for those who are rich, what matters is that they don't have too much education. <laughs> People who are rich and who didn't go to university tend to buy four cars. Unfortunately for me, the ones who went to university 
tend to buy three cars, followed by two, followed by four, followed by one, followed by five. Okay, so I cooked this data. This is not real. I made it, especially for you. But everything else will be real. I modified some data just to give you this. But let's see what happens with other people, because those categories, I have real data actually in this model. So what about people who have very low incomes? Well, for them, it's actually how far do they have to travel to work. If they have between two and five miles to work, they tend to buy one car. Everybody else in that group buys two. What about people with the median income? The person who said uh, number of children, you were right. For people in the middle income, what matters is how many children you have. And if you have exactly one child, you buy one car. If you don't have children or you have more than one child, you tend to buy two cars, which is kind of interesting. But don't stop here. You can say amongst those with this income who have more than four children, what is the next discriminant? Well, for those, the next level in this decision tree is how many children stay at home. So if you have more than four children, of which at least three are at home still, you need three cars according to this data. This data was actually taken from a United States database. As you realize over there, they love using cars, especially because children drive themselves to school. So if you have a lot of um, children at home, you kind of need um, more cars. Okie dokie, this was your first decision tree and you have just found out that it tells you a lot about the meaning of your data this way, but you could also summarize everything as a nice little dependency network, which says that for the number of purchases, the most important discriminant is their income, as you have seen in the tree, followed by number of children, commute distance, level of education, occupation, age, somebody was right, and number of children at home. Unfortunately, the gentleman who suggested gender, you were not. That was eliminated by the data mining process because it turns out that it doesn't matter whether it's men or women, they tend to buy the same number of cars. So this is an easy way to find out those relationships between uh, the variables using a decision tree. Now, I'm not going to explain how to test it, but I will quickly show you that because I want to move to my remaining scenarios. So here, under the mining accuracy chart button, when you click this button, there is this thing called a lift chart. And I will build a lift chart for two car buyers by clicking on this button. Notice how fast this graph came. This graph actually took 3,000 calculations. They were done live when I clicked the button. Predictions are very fast. And the lines that you see on this graph mean this line, random model, blind model, the worst model you have. Uh, actually, you can have worse than random, but typically random is the worst. The red line is... Uh, the best model you could have. This is the magic. If you had a machine which knows exactly who really buys that number of cars, you would get this line. And this is my model. This is what I built with data mining. Your job when you are testing a model is to get this line as close to here as possible and as far away from here as possible. Also, to validate it, you would look at the classification matrix to find out how many data points were right and wrong, and you would perform a cross-validation 10-partition model test. I'm not going to show you that because it takes a little longer, but this is how you would validate the model before you believe it. So you build it using a decision tree, you validate it statistically. Okay, what's next? Clustering. The clustering technique is probably as or maybe even slightly more important than decision trees for any data miner. It is used to segment data points into different classes. It is used to regress numerical data and my favorite and probably for you one of the most important uses, anomaly detection. When you are looking for fraud, out of pattern, this or that, you are almost always clustering. In the session I have um, uh, later this afternoon, when I'm showing you automatic input validation routine with no coding, well, very little coding, I will actually use clustering technique to build the model of what's normal in your data before I use it for data validation. So how is it used for anomaly detection? Well, have a look at this. Here we have three dimensions. Dimension of age, dimension of, uh, sorry, of gender, and the relationship to the head of household. 
So we have, uh, you don't need a computer for that, about three clusters. Can you see those three clusters with your eyes? You should be able to. We have the male sons, the female daughters, and the parents who are older and of both genders. So you see the data points cluster naturally in those three dimensions, and you can do it with your own eyes very easily. Clustering algorithms do exactly that, but not just in three dimensions. They can do it in a hundred, a thousand, or a ten thousand dimensions, although for those larger numbers you certainly need the enterprise edition of SQL Server. When you are clustering in multiple dimensions, one of the advantages is that you can suddenly see a data point like this. It belongs to no cluster. So you quickly know that this is an outlier or an anomaly. That's how you detect out of pattern things. What is it, by the way? That is a male parent who happens to be also a bit of a daughter and is young. So it's a young male parent who is a daughter. Can you see that? It wouldn't make sense. It's not in a real cluster. That's why it has been found to lie outside. Now, it's not always unusual completely. It can be real. It can be a real data point, but it's not typical. Anyway, let me show you how would you do it this time to simplify things using Excel. I will use Excel and clustering to very quickly find outliers. Let me switch over to my demo machine and let me open a spreadsheet in Excel of data points similar to the ones you saw earlier. I have some people who are not yet my customers here with all of their demographics. Over here you can see I have all the data we've been looking at before, but I don't know how many cars they will buy and I don't know what profit they generated because this is new customers. I bought this database from some marketing company. And just to give you a feeling, I don't have much data here. I only have 4,246 data points. By the way, Excel and SQL Server data mining is limited to one million rows. If you have more than one million rows, you cannot do it in Excel. You have to do it in Business Intelligence Development Studio today and in SQL. Excel, however, does not do data mining. Excel, this, is only the interface to the technology you were looking at earlier. How do you connect one to the other? free of charge from Microsoft, data mining add-ins for Office 2007. Search on Microsoft for data mining add-ins, make sure you use the version for SQL 2008 and Office 2007, and they add two tabs. The tab here called data mining, which does everything that you could do in bids and is easier for some people, especially non-developers like it. So you probably will not benefit from it, but non-developers tend to like that because it puts things in order. First, you prepare the data, for example, by cleaning it. Then you model the data. Then you check its accuracy and you build uh, eventually a model that you use and browse. However, the add-ins also add one other tab called Analyze, which comes with these lovely simple-to-use buttons which provide the power of data mining in a simplified UI. And the button I want to use right now is the Highlight Exceptions button. How does it work? I click the button, I say Run, it sends the data to SQL Server 2008 Analysis Services to perform predictions twice First, it will perform a clustering analysis to find the clusters. It did it, and now it's doing it for the second time. For every row of data, it asks a question. Are you an exception? Are you an exception? And it found for me 111 exceptions, of which you see 26 exceptions deal with total number of children, but we have no exceptions on marital status, gender, and home ownership. So what are those exceptions you want to know? Click on the original spreadsheet, and I'm just scroll perhaps through it a little bit, and you can see that some of the rows have been highlighted in brown color. And for those that are in brown, always one column is highlighted in bright yellow. That means that Grace Smith is an exception because she was born in 1924. Obviously, you don't need data mining to find that this is an unusual year to be born compared to all of the other data points, but it is an exception. However, let me show you a different data point. What makes this person an exception? They have one car. Well, how is that an exception? I have many others who have one car. Be Sorry? 
Maybe because he's rich? Well, actually, let's find out. It's because he has a reasonable level of education, quite far to travel to work, happens to have, uh, actually he's not too rich, but good, good income, happens to also be uh, kind of reasonably not too young, not too old, kind of in his prime, and has a good job. And since this is American data, oh, and he has a child. And since this is American data, it says that if you are in this bracket, you should have a minimum of two cars. That's why he happens to be an exception. Okay, you don't believe me. So let's look at a different example. <laughs> Let's look at Bailey Hall. Here is Bailey Hall, a lovely lady. She's not an exception right now, but we will make her into an exception. How? Look, Bailey Hall has no children and no children living at home. If you don't have children, you don't have children living at home, unless you run a crash for children or borrow children temporarily, but that would be an exception. So, let's see. I am going to change Bailey from having zero children at home to two. I change it to two, and it's an exception suddenly. How? Well, because it found a pattern. If you have no children, you don't have children at home. In fact, it found a pattern that, generally speaking, number of children at home should be smaller or equal to the number of children you have. Makes sense to you. It doesn't know about having children, but it knows how to find correlations. And isn't that neat, by the way, how Excel's simple macro queries every change against your mining model to find out what's an exception? This is cool technology. Data cleansing, yes. Finding input problems, ah. This is actually how you do input validation, except you would do it from code. So I'm going to show you a live website that does input validation, but that will be my third session of the day, the one which is called, I forgot what it's called. So let me not say that, and let me go to the next bit. We are moving smoothly through our demos to profitability and risk. You may be worried, oh, this guy has only 15 minutes left. Don't worry. My demos, each subsequent demo takes half the time of the previous one. So geometric progression, the last demo will take less than a minute. Don't worry. Profitability and risk means that we want to find out who is going to bring a lot of money and who is not going to repay a loan if you give them that. How do you do that? Neural networks. I knew you wanted to learn about them, so I decided to show them to you. Neural networks are a wonderfully interesting technology because they find a connection between everything and everything, everything like age, education, gender, and income, and customer's loyalty. And many people think when they look at a neural network that these things, the neurons, are important. No, neurons don't do anything useful. What is important are those lines, the axioms that connect the neurons. And when you build a neural network, all the algorithm really does is to strengthen or break some of the axioms. Everything can connect to everything. If there is a pattern, neural networks find a very hidden pattern. So why do we hate them? Actually, we love them and we hate them. We love them because they find patterns. We hate them because unless they are very simple, no one really understands the pattern. Why could that be a problem? Well, let's say I build a neural network to find out who will not repay a loan. So somebody goes to a bank and says, hello, can I have a bank? Let me see. Ta -pa -ta -pa -ta -pa. No. And the customer says, oh, why not? If you use the neural network, the only answer you can give, neural network said no. <laughs> and you cannot explain yourself. So actually, in some countries, it's outlawed to use that because you couldn't explain yourself. But we like them because they are accurate. So couldn't we have like a simpler neural network that's easier to understand and perhaps not as good, but at least easier to understand? Absolutely. How? Give it too much alcohol and kill those neurons in the middle. If you kill the neurons in the middle, basically you simplify it to inputs connected to outputs, it becomes a little bit less intelligent, but it's easier to understand, and we use it. But you couldn't say a less intelligent neural network for marketing purposes, we call it logistic regression. If you ever wanted to know what's logistic regression, that's a neural network that had a little bit too much, and as a result, it is easier to understand. By the way, logistic regression is big. I mean like every credit scoring system around the world uses it. Notably, FICO, Fair Isaac credit scoring system that uh, the world relies on, is one of the bigger users of exactly that. So, 
How about, would it be fun if you could build your very own neural network to find out who will and who will not repay a loan? Sure enough, you can go out and you can use a credit scoring agency, but I want you to be able to do it yourself. So let me show you exactly that in the demo now. So this time to speed things up just a little bit, I will open a, a solution I have prepared earlier called Happy Cars because I have all the data sources and views there. But I will actually create a new mining structure. The new mining structure I will build now will use, uh, uh, as you have guessed, the neural network technique. So I'm selecting neural network as the technique. And I will use a view that I have created earlier. Don't worry, I will show you that view in a second. Actually, I'll show it to you now. That collapses together all of the information you saw before, all of the demographics you saw before, with one important column called status. Status is the status of a loan this person took. So I want to predict the status of a loan based on anything I can find. So status becomes predictable. I will use everything that, again, legally and sensibly I can analyze as my input. So I'm just going through selecting pretty much everything. Sure enough, you could make it more accurate by removing something, adding something, but I'm not going to do it right now in this demo. Last name and middle name. Oh, and it's reminding me I need a key. So, of course, the key is the loan ID because what this view contains is the history of all loans with information about the status. Was it repaid or not, basically? This time, I accept everything as default. So, I just click my way through and I will call it Credit Score Norsk because this way I will make sure I distinguish it from my... Swiss credit scoring system. Anyway, I click finish. The model is here. Let me show you the data very quickly. Let's explore the data. Obviously, it's the same data you saw before, but notice how denormalized this data is. You remember when I said flatten, flatten, flatten? Well, what do you do when you flatten a relationship? You denormalize the data. Elizabeth Johnson now exists five times in this view. Ugh, why? Because she took five loans. And you can see the loans she took here. You can see that she didn't repay two of the loans. I have no idea why I gave her another loan after she defaulted on loan number three and four. Obviously, she, I must like her very much. And notice, I repeat the same stuff. She made five purchases, same profit. So why do you duplicate the data like that? Because that's what you need to do for data mining. For data mining, data has to be denormalized and flattened because each loan is possibly a different case on itself. Okay, so let's have a quick look, mining model, I'm just checking, using neural network predicts the status of a loan. Let me deploy by clicking on this button, and as soon as it has been deployed, let me train this model to find out who repays the loans and who doesn't. Um, you will see another dialog box pop up as soon as the model is there. Uh, neural network, not the fastest of the algorithms that exist over here. It takes a little bit longer than others to find the model, but it is cool because it finds very, very, very hidden patterns. And very often using it, you will be able to find a meaning where no other model worked. Just don't use it as your first one automatically, because if you use it as the very first one, you will probably end up um, never being able to justify yourself to your boss and they will think that you have some kind of black magic at your disposal because he's right, always, but we don't know why. So anyway, let me um, just close that, let me close that and let me, well, what can I do? I could show you that model, right? Yeah, but it's not very interesting. Why not? Because it's a neural network. So what can I show you? Well, I can show you that it's accurate. For example, let's have a look if it predicts well those who will not repay the loan. When I click lift chart, 3,000 predictions are made, and look at that. It's pretty good. This is randomness, this is Mystic Meg, and this is my model. This is a cool model for predicting who doesn't repay the loan. Remember, that's generated from the 3,000 customers we kept aside. So what can I do with it? Predict who will not repay a loan. Of course, you could do it here, but let's do it in Excel since it's just that tiny little bit faster. So I will open again that Excel spreadsheet of new customers that you saw before. I will select all of the data and using now the data mining tab, I will query the model I have created a second ago. 
I click query, hello wizard, and look at the top, credit score Norsk, the model I created. How does it know to look there? Because over here it's connected to the Happy Cars Data Mining Analysis Services database. That connection was set earlier. You possibly need to set the connection if it's not done before. And the data is in Excel. I'm mapping all the columns. What do you want to predict? Mystic Meg asks me, and I'm saying, Mystic Meg, please predict for me if this person repays the loan. I will call it the outcome, and it's simply the status of a loan. And I add it as a predictable output. And Mystic Meg says, for the price of only extra 10,000 kronor, I will let you predict one more thing. Well, that's a good offer, so could you also predict for me what's the probability of not repaying the loan, no matter if they pay or repay. So. We will call it our risk score, and its status is probability of being defaulted. How easy it is. Status, probability, defaulted. You understand exactly what it means. Okay, next, append the results to Excel, finish, and four and a half thousand predictions later, look how fast it is. Those predictions are here. Those are the outcomes of the loan and the probability somebody doesn't repay. Like, look at this person over here. This person has only 1% probability of not repaying the loan. Look at this person, 21% probability of not repaying, and we predict they will keep on paying forever and ever, which is not good for the person, but some banks like when customers never stop repaying, but also always keep repaying. Perhaps they shouldn't get a loan. Wow. Seven minutes to create a credit scoring system from your own data? Yeah, these things are not difficult. So now you want to predict what will they do next? What will they buy after this product they bought? Sequence clustering is the technique for that purpose. Sequence clustering is a very cool combination of clustering with Markov chain analysis that was used for biological genome predictions um, to sequence our DNA. And it's famously used to predict the next click on a website, next transaction. In our case, we will use it to predict what will be the next car this person wants to buy. So I'm switching back to the example I was looking at earlier. Let me just close this, and I will show you this time a ready-made model called sales sequence. I have data which looks like this. It shows me that customer one bought a Vuvu, then a wagon, then a Vuvu, then a Kexis, then a wagon, whilst customer 11006 only bought a Vuvu and never bought anything else. The question is if there is a pattern. How do I find the pattern? Of course, by using my model. The model uses Microsoft sequence clustering, the algorithm I'm discussing now, to predict the next brand movement of the car. Let me show you this model. The model is most interestingly seen here as a state transition diagram. It basically says that Vuvu tends to be the last car in 48% of cases, and it also says that we love Lamborghini buyers because someone who buys a Lamborghini has a 33% chance of buying a Kexis or a Porsche, obviously for the child and the spouse. And as we move the links, you find out that Vuvu is the first car for 29% of people. Oh dear, first car, last car, should I stop selling Vuvu? Let's keep moving that. Ah, not to worry, look at that. Vuvu buyers, in 20% of cases, buy another Vuvu, and another Vuvu, and another Vuvu. Vuvu forever loop basically. It means that surely it has to be one of the best cars. You can analyze it in any way you want. You can also analyze it cluster by cluster, like everybody wants a Vuvu. Cluster 10, everybody wants a wagon. Cluster 2, everybody wants a Toyota. And you can see all of this as cluster transitions over here, meaning that you plug the past of this customer, it predicts what will happen next. Magic? No. Statistics and machine learning a little bit of Markov chain diagram analysis and clustering. That's it. Not very difficult stuff. And for the final scenario and the final demo, I will forecast a numerical future. So the question is now, what will be my sales next year? To do that, we use time series. Time series technique is a combination of good old-fashioned statistics, autoregressive trees, integrated moving averages, and a fast Fourier transformation in order to detect seasonality of data. Because every December is better than every February, normally, especially in this part of the world. So 
to nicely close the session, I'm going to actually show you that in the closing demo. And because we've done a few things in Excel, for this I will also use Excel, here is some data for sales numbers in different regions on a month-by-month -month basis. As you see, it goes to June 2006, and I want to predict what will happen next. So I select my data, and using the forecast data mining button, I say, please forecast the next five months for me. When I click the run button, it goes away. SQL Server is looking right now for the answers, and they were, and the answers have been found. It turns out that the sales here in America will be good, but not so good in Europe and Pacific. And notice the shape of the broken line, which indicates forecast future, beautifully follows the periods in the past. If you want to, you could also see this data appended numerically here at the bottom to test it, or perhaps to validate that you were right, or perhaps that you weren't so right in making your predictions. Ladies and gentlemen, in my slides, I uh, I'm not going to talk about this slide, but I give you a slide that summarizes all of the techniques so that you can read about it later if you want to find out which technique is good for you. I will talk about some of the other more advanced uses today, but right now I would like to point out that all of the demos, examples, APIs, etc. are at sqlserverdatamining.com, my five and a half hour seminar at microsoft.com forward slash technet spotlight, and a book you should buy if you are interested is called Data Mining with SQL Server 2010 by Jamie McLennan and Jacques Vitang, guys who basically wrote this technology. Jamie is the lead developer at Microsoft for data mining. In summary, data mining is powerful. Hopefully you have seen that um, it's also kind of unknown. It turns mountains of data into intelligence. SQL Server Analysis Services have the technology and hopefully you will want to use it today or tomorrow to find whether you were right in the past about something. My time is out, so I wish you a pleasant rest of NTC. Thank you.